test during the preovulatory phase of their cycle. So again, the point is that that preovulatory phase of the cycle seems to create a bidirectional mutual attractiveness. Now, also extremely interesting is that this effect does really seem to have something to do with ovulation because in both studies, they had women that were taking oral contraception or not. And what they found was if a woman is taking oral contraception, it prevented that peak in perceived attractiveness by the men, meaning men no longer perceived a woman to be more attractive at a particular phase of their cycle. And also, women taking oral contraception no longer preferred the odors of more symmetrical men during the preovulatory phase of their cycle. Halfway there. I want to make sure that it's especially clear that it is not the case that oral contraception reduced the perception of a woman as attractive. That did not happen in these studies. It reduced the further increase in a male's perception of her as attractive and if women took oral contraception, it Ten prevented seconds. them from preferring more symmetrical men based on the odors of those men. Now, I realize there are a lot of variables here. We've got odors, we've got symmetry, we've got menstrual cycle, pre-ovulatory, non-pre-ovulatory, and we have uh, whether or not people are taking contraception or not. But the basic finding is that depending on where women are in their menstrual cycle influences both men's perception of them as attractive and their perception of men as attractive and oral contraception eliminates that effect. So I share with you those data to illustrate that we often think that somebody is attractive or not based on, I don't know, how they look, uh, their skin, their hair, et Halfway cetera. There. But it also illustrates that their odor is a powerful cue for some people more than others. You know, some of us tend to be more olfactory driven than others. Although if you watched the Huberman Lab podcast episode that I did with Professor David Buss from the University of Texas, Austin, who's a luminary in the field of evolutionary psychology and has studied mate Ten choice seconds. and mate selection bias over decades. He's really one of the founders of that field. He emphasized findings that odor for many people is a maker or a deal breaker, uh, meaning there are some people that even if somebody has all the characteristics that they're looking for in terms of kindness and attractiveness and values and other features that would, that would and should be of very high priority in selecting a mate, that if they, if someone does not like the way that person smells, their innate body odor, independent of colognes and perfumes and soaps, et cetera, that that's often a complete and total deal breaker. I'm sure there are some of you that can relate to that. And there's some of you Halfway um, there. perhaps for which that is not the case. And you can't even imagine that being such a powerful variable. And yet the data suggests that indeed it is a powerful variable for many people out there. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer seconds. information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Thesis. Thesis makes custom nootropics. Now, nootropics is not a word that I'm usually a fan of because nootropic means smart drug. And there are a lot of different aspects to being smart or to intelligence. There's the ability to focus. There's the ability to task switch. There's the ability to be thesis under their goals that these simulations that they've made for me in the targeted effects of the nootropics and energy and thesis for you. Again, that's takethesis.com slash Huberman and use the code Huberman at checkout to get 10% off your first box. Halfway Today's there. episode is also brought to us by Athletic Greens, now called AG1. I've been taking AG1 since 2012, so I'm delighted that they're sponsoring the podcast reason I started taking AG1 and the reason I still take AG1 once or twice a day is that it covers all of my vitamin mineral probiotic needs. Probiotics are essential because Ten they seconds. support what's called a healthy gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is vital for things like metabolism, hormone function, and also we now know our brain function, things like focus and memory and our general immune system. With AG1, I get the probiotics I need. I get the vitamins and minerals that I need to cover any nutritional gaps if I'm not eating optimally, and even if I am eating optimally, AG1 can further support metabolism, hormone function, et cetera. In fact, whenever people ask me, what's the one supplement that I should take if I can only take one supplement, I always say AG1. I take mine early in the day. I mix it with water and some lemon or lime juice. I love the way it tastes. And I'll take it again later in the day, typically in the late afternoon. If you'd like to try Halfway Athletic there. Greens, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman and claim a special offer. They're giving you five free travel packs that make it really easy to mix up AG1 while you're on the road, in the car, on the plane, et cetera. 
and a year's supply of vitamin D3K2. There's a ton of data now supporting the fact that vitamin D3 is critical and that most of us seconds. don't get enough vitamin D3, even if we're getting ample sunlight. Vitamin D3 is important for metabolism, hormone function, brain function, and many other aspects of our biology. So again, if you go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman, you can get a special offer of the Athletic Greens, five free travel packs, and the year supply of vitamin D3 K2. Today's episode is also brought to us by Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better understand your body and help you reach your health goals. Now, I've long been a believer in getting regular blood work done for the simple reason that many of the factors that influence your immediate and long-term health can only be discovered from a quality Halfway blood there. test. And nowadays, with the advent of modern DNA tests, you can also get information, for instance, about how your biological age compares to your chronological age, which, of course, is a vital measurement. Now, one of the major issues with blood tests and DNA tests out there is that people get the information back that a uh, lipid marker Ten seconds. of one type, it might be high or low, or that a hormone of another type might be high or low, but they don't give you any information about what to do with that information. Inside Tracker makes that all very easy to navigate. Once you get your results back, you can click on any of those results, and Inside Tracker will immediately show you things that you can do, for instance, with your nutrition or supplementation or lifestyle factors to help you bring those numbers into the ranges that are appropriate for you. So it's immensely powerful, not just in terms of the measurements, but also it provides some directives that can help bring those measurements into the ranges that are best for your immediate and long-term health. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can visit insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. Just use the code Huberman at checkout. Let's talk about desire, love, and attachment. And of course, these are topics that grab tremendous interest, so it's worth us defining our terms a little bit before going any further. Of course, we can have many different kinds of loves. There's romantic love. Ten seconds. There's love of family, so-called familial love. There's love of pets. We can even love objects where we can feel as if we love objects. We can love certain activities. We can have friends that we love and so on and so forth. The word love is used to encompass a lot of different types of relationships. Today, we are mainly going to be focused on romantic love and the neural mechanisms of romantic love. I want to acknowledge here at the outset that most of the studies of romantic love have focused on monogamous heterosexual love. And also, when we talk about studies focused on desire and attractiveness and attachment, that's also the case. And that simply reflects the general bias of the literature over the Halfway last there. 100 years. It does, of course, not rule out that similar or different mechanisms could be at play in non-monogamous relationships, in homosexual relationships, or in relationships of any kind or variation. It's also worth us defining our terms around desire. It can mean lust. Ten it seconds. It can mean the desire for long-term partnership. So we need to define our terms. And throughout, I will do my best to very carefully define what I mean by desire, what I mean by love, and what I mean by attachment. The formal study of love and desire and attachment goes back to the early 1900s. One of the classic studies on this is entitled Love and Desire. It was published in 1912 and really focused on two opposing themes within romance. One is love, which in that paper was really meant to include attachment and dependence or Halfway interdependence there. between individuals, right? And the other end of the spectrum being desire or the sexual desire for another. And romance was meant to encapsulate both those things, love and desire. And for much of the 1900s, it was thought that love and desire were on sort of opposing ends or in kind of a push-pull. And it was the dynamic push and pull between love and, and desire that one could define romance. And that actually led to much of what's out there in the psychological literature. Today, we are going to explore some neurobiological studies, some studies of the endocrine system, meaning the hormone system, that actually support that general model. And I'll point you toward a, what I think is a very useful book in thinking about how relationships can both form and last over long periods of time and how those relationships can include both desire and interdependence. I'll also talk Half about some studies there. that have really focused on why relationships succeed and why they fail and how that relates to whether or not there is sufficient amounts of attachment and desire. 
So today we're going to talk about the science and indeed you'll also get some tools. Those tools should be useful to you whether or not you happen to be in a relationship or not, whether or not you're seeking a relationship seconds. or not. I'd like to begin with an anecdote. And this is not an anecdote about my relationship history. It's an anecdote about my scientific history. When I started graduate school, the chairman of the department I was in at the time said to me, you know, most PhDs last longer than most marriages. And indeed, he was right. And also, most marriages in this country end in divorce. I think it's about 50% with a slight skew toward more ending in divorce than um, persist until death do them part. But nonetheless, it's about half. And most marriages end before the eight-year period is up. Most PhDs there. take anywhere from four to nine years. So there was a bit of a smearing of averages there. But the point he was trying to make really landed home for me. Um, it did not scare me of, out of uh, relationships, nor did it scare me out of a PhD, obviously. What it did illustrate was that there's something about our attachment machine Ten seconds. that can be very, very compelling, such that people take on tremendous levels of commitment. I have to imagine that most people enter marriages assuming that they're going to stay in those marriages. I don't think most people enter marriages thinking they're going to get divorced. But that if 50% of those commitments end in divorce, there must also be mechanisms by which our attachments can break. And today we're going to talk about both the forming of attachments and the breaking of attachments, what can prevent those breaks in attachments, and indeed what can lead to reattachments. There are biological mechanisms to desire, love, and attachment. That's abundantly clear. Halfway now, there. There's a robust and very large literature in animal models. What I mean by that are field studies and laboratory studies in primates of different kinds, such as macaque monkeys or bonobos. Um, people have looked at these sorts of things, believe it or not, in ducks, in laboratory mice, in different types of Ten birds, seconds. et cetera. And if you look at that literature, you can essentially find biological examples in the animal kingdom for just about any behavior that you can easily map to human behavior. So for instance, uh, there's a species of animal called the prairie vole. In one portion of the United States, this prairie vole species is monogamous. They only mate with one other prairie vole, only raise young with one other prairie vole for their entire life. And in another region of the United States, the same species of animal, the prairie vole, will mate with many individuals. They're non-monogamous. And the major difference, at least as far as we know, between the prairie voles in one location and another Halfway location there. is the levels of a molecule called vasopressin in the brain and body. Vasopressin is present in humans. It has numerous biological roles. It's responsible, for instance, for controlling the amount of urine that you excrete, the amount of water that you retain, and for sexual desire, as well as um, mate seeking. Ten seconds. Levels of vasopressin in prairie voles are strongly determinant of whether or not a prairie vole is going to be monogamous or non-monogamous. Why do I raise this? Well, I raise this because the literature on prairie voles is quite beautiful and has been discussed quite a lot in the popular press. You can look it up with an easy, easily just a web engine search. You'll find lots of information about this, lots of news articles about this, and lots of interpretations as to how vasopressin might be involved in similar or different mechanisms in humans. Now, I don't have a problem with mapping animal studies to humans. I think there's certainly a place for that. But if we just sort of lean back and Halfway look at there. the giant mass of studies in animals and their uh, be mating behavior and their mate selection behavior, you can essentially find examples of anything. You can find examples of uh, polygamy. You can find examples of um, cheating, you know, of infidelity. You can find examples of all sorts of different behaviors that in your own mind you can map Ten to human seconds. behavior. But it's really hard to make the leap from animal models to humans in any kind of direct way. And so thankfully, there's been tremendous work done in the last mainly 20 years or so looking at human mate selection, human desire, human love, and human attachment. So we're mainly going to focus on those studies today. And where appropriate, we will map those findings back to the findings in animals to see if there are some universal truths or some universal principles about how the neural circuits and biological mechanisms work. But by and large, we're going to focus on human studies today. So unless I say otherwise, the data that I'm referring to today are entirely from human beings. So let's talk about attachment Halfway and attachment there. styles. And this will offer you the opportunity to answer some important questions for yourself, such as, what is 
my, meaning your, attachment style in relationship. One of the most robust findings in the field of psychology is this notion of attachment styles. And this was something that was discovered through a beautiful set of studies that were done by Mary Ainsworth in the 1980s, in which she developed a laboratory condition called the strange situation task. Now, the strange situation task has been studied over and over again in different cultures, in different locations throughout the world. And in preparing for this episode, I actually spoke to three different psychologists. I spoke to a psychoanalyst, I spoke to a cognitive behavioral psychologist, and I actually spoke to a psychiatrist, excuse me, not a psychologist, but a psychiatrist with a medical degree and asked, is the strange situation task and the various attachment styles that emerge from that task, are those still considered valid? And indeed, Halfway all there. three of them said, if ever there was a literature in psychology that is absolutely tamped down and has a firm basis in both data and real world principles and real world examples, it's this notion of attachment styles. So what is the strange situation task? The strange Ten situation seconds. task involves a parent, typically a mother in the studies that were done, but a parent or other caregiver bringing their child their actual child into the laboratory and there's a room with a stranger and the mother enters the room with the child and there's some toys in the room and typically the mother and the stranger will talk obviously the stranger is part of the experiment it's not just some random person off the street and the child is allowed to move about the room they can observe the mother interacting with the other person or not they can play with toys or not but then at some point the mother leaves and then at some point later, designated Halfway by the there. experimenter, the mother comes back. And what is measured in these studies is both how the child, the toddler, reacts to the mother leaving and how the child reacts to the mother returning at the end of the experiment. And oftentimes this will have Ten two seconds. or three different phases where the mother will bring the child in, then leave, then come back in and leave. <laughs> There are also studies in which the behavior of the child with the stranger is also examined. So there are a lot of variations of this, but the basic findings are that toddlers, children, fall into four different categories of attachment style, and that these attachment styles can predict many features of adolescent, teen, young adult, and even adult attachment styles not in strange situations of the sort that I just described, but in romantic attachments. Halfway there. I should mention also that attachment style is plastic, meaning it can change across the lifespan. So as I described the results, I described the different attachment styles that are out there. And if any of those uh, resonate with you or um, bring to mind certain people in your Ten life, seconds. please do not assume that those attachment styles are rigid and fixed for the entire lifespan. There are also terrific data that indicate that through specific processes, both psychological and some biological um, adjustments, that people can change their attachment style, and that indeed people who have different attachment styles can change the attachment styles of others. But just to make very clear what the results of the study were, I want to review what the four different attachment styles are, and typically people fall into one group or another, but not several. So the four patterns of attachment that were revealed by these studies, again, were revealed by examining the behavior of the child Halfway in response there. to the mother leaving the re and the mother returning and the child's response to the stranger that is in the room with them. The first style is the so-called secure attachment style. In the nomenclature of this kind of um, study, these are the so-called B babies, as in the letter B, bulldog, B. Not for Ten bulldogs, seconds. but just to designate this category. The secure attachment style is one in which the child will engage with the stranger, with the experimenter, Last while round. the parent is present in the room, but that when the parent, typically it's a mother, but when the parent or other caregiver leaves, the child does get visibly upset. They might whine, they might...